Welcome to the Sussex Strategy Group Election 43 show. My name is Brett James, principal of Sussex Strategy Group, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Carl Belanger. Carl is a well-known strategist, media pundit, and, uh, and a radio host of a French language drive time show on 104.7 here in Ottawa. Uh, Carl's a longtime friend of the firm, and of course, uh, best known for his uh, his longtime roles with the federal New Democratic Party. Um, Carl, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, today, we want to focus on the NDP, um, as well as talk a little bit about uh, Quebec uh, political dynamics in this federal election. Um, Carl, for those who aren't aware, was a longtime, I think, both uh, head of communications and um, and Principal Secretary for Jack Layton and Thomas Mulcair and the head of so the many party titles. as well. So many <laughs> titles, exactly, for the federal NDP. So a perfect person and friend of the firm to join us to talk about uh, the prospects for Jagmeet Singh and the NDP in this election. Uh, let's start with, uh, with the general. Um, the NDP is not polling well, as everybody knows. In fact, some polls have the Green Party ahead of the NDP on a national basis. Um, uh, of course, what matters is what happens locally and regionally and where those votes actually get spread. But tell us um, a little bit about where you see the party, especially relative to what you've experienced in past elections and what they need to do to improve that opportunity. Well, right now, the party is facing the very real situation and possibility that for the first time in its history, including the history of the CCF, the party before the NDP, uh, that the, the, the party could lose seats in a second consecutive election. It's never happened. Every time the NDP lost seats, it rebounded the next election. Yeah. Uh, the polls right now are indicating that, uh, that uh, it's a very real possibility that the party would lose seats. Uh, in danger, first and foremost, is Quebec. Uh, in some polls, the NDP is polling in fifth place in the single-digit territory. Um, that is really far away from the 2011 orange wave uh, under Jack Layton, and it's also far from what Mulcair was able to achieve in 2015. So those seats are in danger. There's a few. Uh, I mean, there's a, a few seats that could be salvaged with the current polling numbers, just because of the. Uh, strength of the individual MPs that are in place, but there is no safe seat for the NDP in Quebec. Uh, on the flip side, the NDP is doing fairly well in British Columbia and uh, and uh, is is built by the uh, relative strength of the BC NDP government there. Uh, and in Ontario, especially in the 905 area where Jagvid Singh is from originally, uh, Brampton and, and the entire belt around Toronto, um, as well as downtown Toronto, uh, the NDP could do well there, uh, especially considering uh, what's happening on the provincial level, uh, where Doug Ford's government is struggling. The NDP is the official opposition in, in, in Ontario. So there are some possibilities for gains in Ontario. The dynamic, so what I see federally is the federal Liberal Party moved quite a piece left of where, you know, relative to say the, the party of Jean Chrétien. And so it's really crowded the NDP on the left of center spectrum from a policy point of view. Um, in Ontario, uh, while Kathleen Wynne became very unpopular in the last election, which was an opportunity for Andrew Horvath, that party too moved so far left that in some cases Horvath was seen to be more centrist than the Liberal Party on certain issues. Um, and if that was what in part led to some of the growth for the NDP in Ontario, is, is, is moving more to the centre an opportunity nationally as well? Uh, probably not at this point in the cycle uh, because uh, of the way that Justin Trudeau and the Liberals have occupied that territory. Now, the key thing for the NDP is to build a narrative that establish a contrast with the Liberals, and you won't do that by taking the same position as the Liberals or similar position. And, uh, and certainly in the last election, there was a lot of talk about the Liberals outflanking the NDP on the left. Now, I, I, I can take issue with that, uh, you know, that fact. I think it was more a perception than a reality when you look at the actual platforms. But it was a perception nonetheless, and in politics, that's what matters. Um, so in this 
in this election, I think you need to outline where the Liberals have failed progressive voters. What are the broken promises? What are uh, the actions of this government? For instance, on the environment, I think it's an opportunity for the NDP to uh, outline how uh, the Liberals have, have promised to meet uh, even Stephen Harper's targets and have failed to do so while nationalizing a pipeline, uh, which is counterintuitive if you want to save the planet. Uh, so the Liberals are, are back in the old habits of trying to have it both ways. Uh, they've campaigned on the left, they've governed a little more on the right. Uh, the rhetoric is very left in terms of messaging. But when you look at the actual policies and what they've done, uh, there's a lot of actions that were undertaken under Stephen Harper that have been ongoing. That has not changed much. Uh, certainly socially, in terms of the public discourse, the liberals are very good at marketing themselves as a very progressive party. And, and somehow they are helped in that by some elements in the Conservative Party, which, uh, which uh, is creating that contrast between the two main parties right now. You mentioned environmental policy as one opportunity for the NDP, but you also have the Greens who are strong on that right. and on the same side of the spectrum. I view that as pretty crowded territory. Can the NDP actually carve out a unique position to sell to Canadians on the environment? Well, they have uh, come forward with a bold proposal, which include a uh, creation of 300,000 green jobs in the country. In fact, CBC recently fact-checked that uh, proposal and said, yes, it was possible. Uh, that's something the Greens have not fleshed out yet. Uh, when you look at the Green Party, they are really surfing on a brand. Um, it's, you know, people don't really pay attention to what's underneath there. It's not Elizabeth May that drove the Green Party to where it is today. It is the current context, a climate crisis that has not been addressed by the different governments. It's true in Canada, it's true across the world. You see the Greens rising. And provincially in, in this country, you saw the Greens breaking through in Ontario, in New Brunswick, in PEI, where they almost formed government. And if they had had any kind of machine on the ground, they might have been able to pull it up. And of course, in British Columbia, where they hold the balance of power. The problem for the NDP is that the Green is starting to build a credibility as an alternative. And it doesn't really matter what's behind uh, the brand, like the policies don't really matter because people who are parking their vote with the Green Party uh, are doing it based on that, that very brand as opposed to any kind of policies. Uh, what is the NDP brand in contrast to the Green Party? That's the challenge because you're not going to, be, going to be able to outgreen the Greens. So you need to focus a little bit more on the economy job creation while protecting the environment. And that's a difficult uh, thing to achieve, as Justin Trudeau is proving right now. But they could have more credibility there than the Greens, who have really never been in power. That's so right. nobody knows exactly what they might do. Yes. And you might agree or disagree with the NDP policies there, but there is experience and there is a, uh, opportunity for them to say, we've done it. And, and they formed provincially. government provincially yeah, at many levels. And, and, uh, and they also have a better machine on the ground than the Green Party, sure. which if you're looking for an alternative, realistically, the NDP has a better chance of electing more MPs than the Green Party, though that can change. What's the number one barrier to growth for the NDP? Well, the number one barrier uh, is always for the NDP uh, invisibility and not having enough room in the political narrative. If the landscape is such that it is the race in the election is described as a two-way race between the red team and the blue team, there's not a lot of space left for the NDP. And uh, in the past few months, uh, even after Jagmeet Singh got elected to the House of Commons, uh, a lot of people have said that the NDP was not part of that political narrative. It was not part of the stories of the day. It was not part of what people were talking about at home. Uh, so the NDP needs to fight its way on, on into that arena. But if they were polling in traditional territory and more in the high teens or low 20s, mid 20s, they'd be part of that narrative. I think. Part of that dynamic is people don't see that they're they're relevant in the sense of they don't view that they have an opportunity to win. So then they don't get mentioned because they may not be a potential government. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, true. Uh, at the same time, the NDP was polling in the high teens, early, uh, you know, low 20s in, in a few months ago after Jagmeet Singh won the leadership. And the NDP still had trouble to gain traction. And, and Singh certainly was not leaving an impression on Canadians. He's still largely unknown by a majority of Canadians. So I think NDP strategists are banking on a campaign to, um, to help them establish the kind of buzz that uh, was created by Singh when he ran for the NDP leadership, a buzz that certainly translated into many NDP activists 
voting for him, uh, but something that does not translate it within the general public. It takes money to run a federal campaign. Um, much has been written about the NDP having a lot of trouble raising money. And recently, last week, there was uh, there were numbers published on the spend to date. The only thing that's really publicly traceable at the moment is on is on social media spend. But the NDP was nowhere relative to the Liberals and and Conservatives. Um, do they have a chance to raise the kind of money or borrow money as parties do? to run a full-blown national campaign? Well, the NDP has the, the chance to have an asset in downtown Ottawa in the form of a building. It's a Jack Layton building. was bought at a time when the electoral laws were changed uh, before uh, you know, union donation and corporation donations were banned. And so the NDP was able to acquire this building with money from unions mostly. Um, that, so that's an asset against which it can borrow. Uh, it will borrow against it to run as you know as strong as a campaign as they can. Um, the issue is that if they are not able to materialize any kind of success during the next campaign, then what will happen? Right. Because the party had a, a huge debt coming out of the last election, despite having out fundraised its opponents, like the NDP in 2015 raised 50 uh, million dollars, which was a record year for the New Democrats. Uh, right now, the party is uh, barely able to raise a million dollar a year. That is clearly not enough to campaign at the top with the Liberals and Conservatives. You add on top of that, and we'll transition to Quebec in a minute, um, the ruling that says there are a number of constituencies in Quebec that must pay back the House of Commons for expenses. Does that factor into the general NDP fundraising or where the money has to go? Well, it shouldn't because the House of Commons has no authority over the party and the party is not liable for that money. That money is owed by the former members of parliament. Now, what Where can does it, it come from? Well, but this is the thing where, you know, they are personally liable and former MPs, you know, who knows what will happen? The party will make its own decision. Thus far, they've been fighting this and paying the bill for, for the lawyers. Um, uh, the House of Commons have not been, has not been very active either at, at trying to get that money. Um, I mean, we could go on and on about that, but I don't see that as a major obstacle. Okay. Uh, I think at some point, uh, you know, the NDP may may step up to help uh, the current and former MPs who still owe money to the House of Commons. But uh, the reality is that I don't think it factors in the calculation for the party. But it okay. certainly did help the party to focus on the election that was ahead. You mentioned Quebec. We, you touched on Ontario a little bit, um, and BC. You mentioned so. If there's one place that you see realistic opportunity for growth of NDP prospects, where is it? I think British Columbia. I think that uh, there's uh, there's possibilities there. Uh, the mayor of Vancouver, Kennedy Stewart, is a former NDP MP, yeah. and he was the uh, you know the white knight fighting against the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Was elected basically on that platform last time federally as an MP, ran on that uh, for Vancouver mayor with the same platform. Um, the key thing is, will they be able to sustain a campaign like that and be able to grow elsewhere? Or will they have to sacrifice some possibilities elsewhere because of that anti-pipeline vote that they're trying to, to uh, get and to keep away from the Green Party? Because of right. course, they will campaign against it as well. Let's focus a little bit on Quebec because you're you're also a specialist and a commentator on Quebec politics. Um, fascinating dynamic there. I think uh, for those of us who are you know a little bit of political geeks uh, who and who watch this stuff, um, my view uh, just in general, we have um, a, a liberal party that remains strong in Quebec. They had come back from, uh, I guess, a nadir, as it were, after the uh, sponsorship scandal. Trudeau's prospects have been better. Uh, the NDP, of course, was extremely strong, as you mentioned, under Jack Layton and, and also under Mulcair, but suffering at the moment. Um, where do those NDP seats and those votes go is key. Uh, I think that the Liberals, if you ask them today, would say that they intend to grow their seats in Quebec. Andrew Scheer believes he can grow his seats in Quebec. And the Bloc believes that they're going to grow their seats in Quebec, all roughly at the expense of the NDP, uh, as it were. Not directly, but but that's the net effect, I think. Do you disagree or well, do you I, see it differently? I, well, I think that the, the, just by default, the NDP seats are in danger and therefore the other parties are going to try to, to gain from, from them. 
Um, I think there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination uh, across the party lines and some seats that were liberals because the NDP came a strong second might be easier for the liberals this time. Other seats where the conservatives uh, won might be more difficult for them to retain, but there's also three and four-way race, maybe even five-way race because we have Maxime Bernier, wh whom you did not mention. I did not mention. Uh, but could, could make a breakthrough in Quebec, certainly his own writing of both as a tradition of voting uh, against conformity, let's just say, sure. uh, and, uh, and, and Bernier could be a wild card, especially in the Quebec City area and on the east end of the province. Um, so the problem for the NEP is that in fifth place, there's mathematics that gets, you know, hard to win seats. Um, but, but, you know, it's not that long ago that the NEP won a majority of seats in Quebec, so that potential is still there. It's residual. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles, of course, is that one of the biggest political debate that is happening in Quebec is uh, is about the religious symbols and 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 the leader of the NDP is wearing uh, very visible religious symbols for so for a part of the population uh, it's a non-starter and uh, so that makes that that's compounding the problems of the NDP in Quebec right now. So if he wanted to work in a hospital or a school, he wouldn't be allowed to wear his turban today. Uh, well, it depends on which schools uh, okay. because uh, the, 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 you have to be in a position of authority. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit complicated and there's all kinds of weird rules about that. But certainly you couldn't be a judge or a policeman or anything like that. Uh, but he can be an elected official, uh, which, you know, is not banned specifically by Bill 21. But the the thinking behind Bill 21 is supported by a lot of people, as you say, that would not be supportive of somebody who's wearing a religious symbol. Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so 20 years ago, a vote for the bloc would have been viewed as uh, support for uh, for separation, more so than not just simple nationalism. Today, is a vote for the bloc the same thing as it was 20 years ago? No. Uh, first of all, the bloc has had two very difficult elections in 2011 and 2015, um, and, and people thought they were dead. Uh, they are making a bit of a comeback, and it's partly because of the weakness of the NDP. A lot of bloc voters voted for the NDP, and now that the NDP is struggling, uh, they're back into their uh, more natural, comfortable zone. Um, the, the current situation at the provincial level with the Parti Québécois uh, in fourth place um, it does not indicate that there's any rise of the separatism movement in Quebec. But if you, uh, if you are rejecting the Trudeau Liberals and you do not like Andrew Scheer, the alternative is the Bloc Québécois. It's a safe parking spot for, for voters right now who want to oppose the two main parties as opposed to the other national parties, the Greens and the NDP. Um, I mentioned the sponsorship scandal a couple of minutes ago, and as I said, my view is that it, it hurt the Liberal Party in Quebec for some time. And it revived the Bloc Québécois too. It did. Because at the time, the Bloc was not doing well, and then the sponsorship yeah. scandal allowed them to come back. Gave them life. Uh, the major scandal of the Trudeau era, uh, this particular government, has been SNC-Lavalin. Uh, but does, is it viewed the same way in Quebec? I mean, uh, it's a nationally, it's viewed, uh, I think, negatively because people see a government trying to do something special, again, for a Quebec interest, um, not necessarily lining the pockets of party organizers the way the sponsorship scandal was. But how does, it, how does that particular issue play in Quebec? Or is it seen positively because uh, Trudeau was fighting for Quebec? Well, it's not seen as positively as, as it could have because the Liberals did not make uh, a political uh, fight out of it. They did not lay the, the case uh, in front of people to, to understand why they were doing it. They were basically trying to get away with it, um, you know, getting the news, the good news of saving the jobs without being seen as meddling into the file. So it, it backfired on them. Uh, that said, the chattering class certainly in Quebec and the, the, the pundits and analysts, columnists and editorialists uh, were certainly more forgiven, uh, forgiving of, of the Trudeau Liberals uh, on this file than they were in the rest of the country. Uh, partly because SNC-Lavalin is a firm that has a, uh, is seen as a gem in Quebec. It's, uh, it came out of the, the big Hydro-Québec uh, construction complex uh, you know, early, like in the 60s. And, and so that firm grew from Quebec and is seen as as, uh, as still, uh, you know, one of the best uh, tool of Quebec's innovation and, and engineering industry. 
Um, so the, the, the question is, when it comes to, to, to SNC, is like, will the Liberals be willing to make the political case for it during the campaign? Because it will resurface. And, um, and they have not done a good job of doing so. Of course, jobs are important. Uh, but why are those jobs important as opposed as opposed to other jobs? Um, and uh, in order to do that, to make that political case, they may have to pay a price elsewhere, with which, as of yet, they have been unwilling to pay. I've had pollsters on this show, and we've talked uh, recently about, to my surprise, uh, and I guess to Canadians' credit, ethics has actually pulled very high in terms of issues of concern going into the election. And of course, traditionally, it's economy, it's jobs, it's healthcare, environment. Those are always near the top of the agenda for Canadians' concerns. But ethics is right, right there at uh, 61%, uh, certainly in Ontario, and I don't have the national number in front of me. With the return of Gerald Butts to the Liberal campaign in a very profiled way, um, what does that say about the government's concern around ethics? Because I think, it, as you allude to, it brings back the SNC thing front and center. Um, and, and again, how does that impact Quebec? Are they, are they focused on the same ethics issues that maybe the rest of Canada might be? Well, they are focused on ethics in general, um, but, but the name Gerald Butts is not a household name anywhere. And, and so I guess what the Liberals thought uh, about that is that the price they were paying for him being away was higher than the price they would pay for bringing him back. Mm -hmm. So he's back. Uh, the opposition parties uh, have had not had a lot of traction on SNC over the past few months, uh, certainly not since the House uh, rose for the summer. Um, and uh, we'll see if they're going to be able to make hay out of it. Uh, when it comes to ethics, though, I think there's a general trend in, in the country and, and perhaps across the world. Uh, people are just fed up with politicians in general and they have no more patience or loyalty, which creates a very volatile environment. Uh, people are, are trigger happy to change government even after one term. Uh, and that's creating waves. Uh, we've seen waves over the past 10, 15 years in Canada where Suddenly, the NDP is in power in, in Alberta. Uh, you know, parties that were uh, trailing badly are suddenly winning the election. Party that did not exist, like the Coalition Avenir Quebec, did not exist ten years ago, suddenly is in power. Uh, those trends are, are 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 going to continue, and that's partly what gives you know opportunities to the NDP because people are volatile, and and you cannot take anything for granted. And so you, you mentioned pollsters, and one, one bit of information in those polls that I think is interesting for the NDP, uh, speaking of opportunities, is that when you look at a party preference and you ask these voters who are willing to change party during the election, if you ask them who is their number two choice, the NDP is the number two choice of the liberal voters, of the conservative voters, and of the green voters. And probably of the Bloc Québécois voters, I, don't have, you know, I haven't seen the numbers, but I'm pretty sure that's accurate. Which means that if Singh and the NDP are able to transform those number two preferential choice into number ones, mm -hmm. uh, lots of potential votes there. So let's finish with a prediction, if you dare to make one. The Liberals hope to increase their seat total to 50. I'm going to ask you if they get there. The NDP wants to hang on to as many as they can. I want to know, if, can they get five? Can the Conservative Party uh, exceed 15 seats, I think, is a, is a goal that they have. Uh, and then, of course, that leaves what, what does the bloc walk away with? So what, do you have any predictions for Quebec? Uh, I think that the Liberals will lose some seats in Quebec. I think that the NDP will also lose a majority of their seats. They will probably hang on to one, maybe two, if they're lucky. Wow. I think that uh, the bloc Quebecois will regain party status. And I think the Conservatives will, will uh, do well in Quebec, certainly better than they did since Brian Mulroney, I think. The wild card is Maxime Bernier. I'm going to gamble that he's going to win his seat in both. That'll be interesting to see, too. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Carl Belanger. Thank I you. appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to our next show with Sussex Election 43.